So I'm Tug, Artuk Dual Graal, I'm working at MAPA. And today I will talk about a fast car on big data. Uh, the, this presentation, we have built that with some of my colleagues because we have been asked by uh, one of the Formula One team to uh, help them to define what could be the next architecture for their telemetry uh, tools uh, they use because most of the technology they use today in, in all teams are very close source, uh, close protocol, uh, very proprietary in terms of frameworks and they are looking for new stuff uh, to uh, build the next generation of their application. So we built a demonstration uh, to show what could be the next architecture. Unfortunately, this team have not yet made the decision to work with us, but at least I was able to uh, build a talk uh, around that. So before we start, uh, I'm working as a technical evangelist at MAPA. Uh, MAPA is uh, one of the big data platforms you can use, and before I, w I used to work at uh, MongoDB, Coachbase, uh, Exo, that is a social network for the enterprise, and Oracle, so mostly, as you can see, from a software vendor point of view, and mostly from uh, data and uh, middleware technology. When I was at Oracle, I was working on the Java EE container. And I also built, uh, with some friends, uh, the Java user group in Nantes, where I live, and as you can guess from my accent, if you don't know the city, it's in France. <laughs> um, and you have my uh, contact info. And if you want to know, Tuc Dual is not a French name, it's a Celtic name from Brittany, it's from Bretagne, so, and everybody call me Tug, it's a lot easier to remember. So, I'm starting this presentation with what means the data in the context of motorsport and then discussing about their current architectures and what we can build uh, and doing a demonstration and uh, discussions about the different framework we use uh, to do streaming uh, and store the data and process the data. So I'm working for MAPA that we provide, uh, and this is the only product slide uh, that is not an open source project completely. We provide this platform where we have the storage, file system, database, and NoSQL database using JSON or HBase API, and even streaming. And when I will do the demonstration, this is what I use to store on process. So it's a part of Spark, SQL, uh, on a distributed file system on a database. So, the first thing is, what's the point of data? And if you look at uh, a Formula One race on many of the motorsports, you see in the paddock, you have these many, many, many screens providing information to the engineers or to the pilot uh, about the cars, uh, the engine, the different cars, the, the weather, and so on. And it's used for many things. It could be used to track the health of the car, but to define strategy, to analyze the behavior of a car, compare uh, the two different drivers that have suppose are part of the same team, so they have the same car, more or less, because very often they will use all this information to adjust the setting of the car. And some example will be here, you see multiple charts, but the red chart at the top is uh, engine speed, the RPM, the blue one is the speed uh, in kilometer per hour, and you have uh, the G's, lateral G's in green. Uh, how do you press, uh, uh, which gear are you, what are the uh, pressure in the engine, and many, many, many information that has pushed back from the car in real time into the platform, into the paddock. But also, all this data, most of the time, and more and more, you want to keep them for many things, or for many reasons. And allowing you to compare the behavior of the car based on some settings on, uh, that you can capture information in real time allows the team to define some race strategy. For example, when do you want to refuel the car? The impact on the speed, on the weight of the car, the behavior, so you have same car, but same team, two cars with different strategy about option A or option B, when do you want to refuel, what will be the impact? on the speed, on the track, and so on. So many information simply about capturing, analyzing, and deal with it. Knowing that 
it's not authorized to have an engine, a compute engine, somewhere to analyze the data or influence back the setting in real time. You had some things that either the driver can change his behavior or the car has to stop in the paddock and they have to change something. Because technically, we could almost let the drive on a rest track drive itself without uh, any driver in it. So what is interesting is to look at the data you have and the data that it's are used and generated during a, a race or during a, a training. So you have, you have, have it's, so these numbers come from 2015-16, uh, some of them, uh, so probably more information because you can add more and more stuff every day in cars. So 300 sensors in a car, uh, we saw some of them on the chart, so speed, engine, tom uh, Gs, and many things, the current gears and so on. And 2,000 2, channels that will be communicating in the car and back to the paddock to capture and send the information. And uh, data are sent to the paddock in real time every milli uh, in two milliseconds. It's a specific network uh, uh, on the side of the track that is used. And for a race, it's 1.5 billion uh, data points that are generated by one car. Uh, and five million for a full race, uh, full weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Friday for the test, Saturday for the test, and Sunday for the, the day of the race. So it's between five and six gigabytes of compressed data for a car for 90 minutes driving. So it's a lot. And uh, what is interesting is to see the total number of data that are generated for one weekend. It's 240, so it's two, two, uh, two, uh, in uh, 2015, 14, sorry. It's 243 terabytes of data that has been generated during uh, the US Grand Prix. And generating the data is easy. The sensors are here and they generate the data. Capturing the data, storing the data, processing the data start to be challenging. But more importantly, keeping the data forever in a useful way to be able to compare what was the behavior of the car in 2014, 15, 16, try to compare with all the uh, training you do different ways. Imagine it's three days of races, 243 terabytes. So one of the uh, goals of the new architecture is to be able to keep everything, at least all this, this data, and forever uh, in a cheap way. So storage is not that expensive, but what is expensive is to have storage that you can, uh, data store that you can use to do analytics, to do machine learning, to do uh, comparison a bit between different uh, uh, stories. And based on this, we choose to uh, build an architecture that will uh, explain uh, with new framework how you can build a new type of application. So, the goal is in the car, you have a specific link uh, and a global link on the track that will send all the data for all the cars. And then you send the data to each team. So like that, you have a single point where you can capture and store all the data, but each team will have some information. And for each team, one of the goal is to deal with the data in real time on the track. So this is when you see uh, engineers, this will be directly on the track doing so local analytics on local storage. And it could be interesting, depending on the technology you use, in this case, we say you can, for example, in real time, take the data from the track and replicate them in real time into the factory, in UK, in uh, Italy, in, uh, in France, depending on the team. Uh, but keeping the data and processing and sending the data in real time. In this case, it will be some data store and processing layer in the tr on the track, in the paddock for each team, but also the same architecture and tools in the factory. So as part of the uh, process, and based on the volume of information they provide, we define uh, a, simplif a simplified demo uh, for this, where I don't have a Formula One at home, and I'm not sure I could drive it, even if I had one. <laughs> so we use a simulator to generate some data. And we use a streaming technology to send the data and show two things, data processed in real time into a dashboard, 
and data store into a NoSQL engine, in this case, to do, for, to do analytics. So this is the first part of, uh, of the demo. And for this, we use Torx. Uh, Torx is, uh, as the name said, Open Source Racing Car Simulator. And it's a very interesting uh, framework. So it's a, an open source project available on SourceForge, developed in C and C++. And in terms of volume of information, it's not that exciting. I, I could not generate terabyte of data or hundred of gigabyte of data for uh, 60 minutes on these kind of things. But what is interesting, it has a very good uh, uh, physical model. So this tool is used a lot for artificial intelligence, for people that want to simulate speed, braking, the Gs, and so on. So I use this as a, as a tool to generate data on SOS's architecture. So let's uh, show you the demo. So the simulator is running in this specific VM. So I will start on your race. And I didn't enable the, any game or interaction. It's just the, the race is happening by itself. And what you see at the bottom is you see for the first one of the cars, the car that is in red, so the uh, resolution, I don't know, it's the Inferno number seven, I think. You see the gear, the, the, the RPM, so 77,000, the speed, uh, the brake on the throttle, and also the Gs on the different metrics at the bottom. So what's happening here, it's sending data, not only to the game, but also to the data platform in real time using a streaming technology. So let's go here. And this is the data generated directly by the cars, sending into a UI. So I use, in this case, quite simple WebSocket listening to a, a specific topic. And um, my, my lap is maybe a little too long, because one of the very interesting uh, things that people compare, especially during training, but also during race, it's the behavior of the car, obviously, in real time, when you can put alert on these kind of things. Uh, the reason why on the RPM you see a, a car that is a lot, lot faster in terms of number of RPM, it's because if you look at the simulator, you have a car that looks more or less like a Formula One. Uh, so the engine itself, maybe we will see it, it's a red one, yes, you see it in the back sometime. So this engine is a lot, lot faster in terms of RPM, not necessarily in terms of driving, as you can see. <laughs> Uh, but what is interesting in this, for example, is to be able to compare two laps. So you see here, this is just by time, overall of the racing at the top, and this is uh, different laps. So every time, no, uh, did I miss something? No, RPM. Oh, th yes, this is every lap, and you will be able to compare the behavior of the car from one first lap, second lap, and so on. So be able to compare the behavior of the driver or the car and analyze what will be, uh, what we have to do in terms of refueling, changing some braking or some brakes, and so on. So not only here I am generating and pushing data in real time, so that if we go back to a, a small architecture slide, This is simulate, uh, race car simulator sending data to a streaming technology that push in one consumer that at the top is a real-time uh, uh, dashboard. I don't store any data by itself besides the stream. And, but also, I have another consumer that takes the stream and saves the data into a database. And why I'm doing that, it's, this is where you will keep the terabyte of data for later use. And I'm doing it to allow people to do analytics. And you have many tools to do analytics, but one of the most common language to do that is SQL. Uh, and what I use in terms of technology, I will show you the SQL in a minute, all the code about publishing data, consuming data, is based on Kafka. So this is a Kafka API that I will go in a minute. So producing event and consuming event. The uh, dashboard is a simple Java WebSocket D3GS UI, and I store data into MapRDB, so it's a, a, a NoSQL database from MapR, allowing to store uh, JSON document. 
and I consume using SQL, using the project Apache Drill. Apache Drill, it's a SQL on everything engine that can consume data from uh, various data sources. So let me show you uh, Drill itself. So when I say it allows you to consume many ty any type of data, you see at the top, I have class paths, we don't care, but I have the file system, distributed file system. I can consume data from HBase, from Hive, for Kudu, that is another, another storage, from Mongo, and you have many extensions. One of the big uh, things about uh, Drill, it allows you to do any type of query on any type of content, more or less. In this case, I'm using the file system with a NoSQL database. So one query, for example, will be somewhere I have um, a table where I have all the data that has generating that are saved. So I will do a select to get the car on the race ID, uh, group by car on race ID. So you see standard SQL, very basic SQL uh, uh, information. So if I run this query, I have the car, the ID. So I can, for example, say count the number of car, number of race for each car. So just uh, basic things. So in this case, I'm doing also, uh, I want to do a join with a JSON file. Uh, sorry, I'm lost in all my, uh, I will use this one. And I will show you the full statement. Now we come back in a minute about uh, SQL and how important it is even after 40 years of relational database. In this case, you see I have in the, uh, in the inner query, I have a select star from a select field from all cars table. And then I do a join with a JSON file that contains just a car, some information about the driver, group by, and I do some calculation, basic speed for each car average speed for each car. And it's true that in many cases, you, uh, you may develop with uh, any tool to analyze this data, but in many, many cases, people want to be able to integrate that with the reporting tool, including very technical data like that in a, in a racing team. So it's a join between car one, a model on driver coming from the JSON file on the miles per second and kilometers per hour is it's based on the data that has been generated. In this case, we, saw, we store uh, JSON documents in the table. So we have specific function. If you are uh, familiar with SQL, uh, you may have seen this flatten. It's just to unwind uh, the different elements in a list in a JSON document. If I take only this query, and I keep the record this way. One single row is the way the car on all the sensor data. So the flatten is just to create kind of a reverse join to kind of reverse. Each li line has to be one row when you do the query. And one of the interesting parts on why I'm spending some time on drill on SQL, it's in, because in many, many cases, including this, this use case, it gives you access to a GDBC or DBC layer with a powerful language that is SQL for calculation analytic, and analytic. OK? So the biggest question, you are, if, if you start to work on big data project, on big data project, it's not necessarily the volume itself. Is 20 terabytes of data big? Not necessary. You take any relational database, any NoSQL database, you will be able to manage 20 terabytes. It's not difficult. What is hard is, let's say I want to add one terabyte every day, and I want to keep everything. This is where it's becoming a challenge. And this is where you have to think about which platform do you want to use to store and process the information. And what we see in the big data platform is usually you have two ways of storing the data. If you, in this specific use case where you need to continue to scale in the volume of data, it's either the distributed file system or very often a NoSQL database. And very, very, very often you will mix the two storage. 
the raw data will be stored into the file system as some specific format. It could be text file, but very often you will optimize that to have a compressed format that could be distributed on process in parallel on all the nodes of the cluster. So this is what HDFS, the Hadoop file system on Mapper file system, MapperFS, will give you the capability of scale out as much as you want, distributed and replicate the information. And for example, uh, here we could imagine instead of logging everything in the database, logging that into specific file, uh, and then you do the analyse analytics on this. On NoSQL, the, the big, big difference between uh, file system and NoSQL in this case, the database will allow you to access very, very, very quickly one or few records, even modify them. On a file system, if you have a two terabyte file, to modify one single line in the middle, it will be very expensive because you have to find and you have to scan. HDFS, you cannot modify file. On MapperFS, you can. But on a two terabyte, two terabyte file, you won't scan everything to go to a specific line you will probably use uh, a NoSQL database. And the other benefit of using the NoSQL engine on the file system, schema is managed by the application, not by the database itself. Because if you say, I have 200, on, uh, 200 terabytes of data every race weekend, and I want to keep the, tr the information for the last 20 years, we can guess as a number of information sent by the car from 20 years, from today in, in, tw in 20 years, you will have a lot more information. So you need something that is easy to store and evolve over time in terms of data structure. So this is one of a uh, very interesting part of uh, MAPA, Hadoop, uh, and other big data platform. So the key part here is how do you capture the information, and you want to do that in real time. Uh, when I call it fast car on big data, I could, uh, I could say fast data on, on big car or fast car, because one of the, pro more and more when I work, it's all about t moving to real time. Processing the data, capturing the data every time it's generated. So the data stream, it's about moving the event, moving the data. It could be every hour, but it could be every second, or so it could be every milliseconds, depending on what your system is doing. And for this, in the big data world, Kafka, and in many other worlds also, but at least when you look at what we do today with big data, it's really around Kafka. Kafka is a tool that you use, and Kafka has been built by LinkedIn in 2011, implemented in Scala mostly, and you can develop uh, applications easily to uh, uh, publish and subscribe information. And the key part, Kafka has been built from day one to scale out and be distributed. If you have 100 messages every minute, you don't need Kafka. If you have 300, 3 million messages every second, we have a customer, it's, one, it's 11 million every second on a, on a distributed on multiple data centers, but they have to capture that. And the way it works, classical publish subscribe, so you have producer. In this case, it's a Torx application, and you have consumer, and in the middle, you have a cluster of something. In this case, it's Kafka. And the way it works to make it scalable if, uh, and efficient, it's like always when you talk about volume of data that you want to read and write efficiently, you have to partition. You have to divide the data set you use in multiple partitions that could be div, uh, di um, uh, distributed on many machines. So when you are pushing a message into a topic, this topic will have multiple partitions. And usually, this partition will be on multiple physical machines. So like that, you can write in parallel and make it very efficient to scale out. But in the context of uh, Kafka, these data are all also stored where the broker is running. So if you look at the way it's working, you also need, sorry, you also need to read in parallel. And the, I will come back to the storage in a second. But the way it works when you have uh, the topic with multiple partitions, you need to not only to be able to write in parallel on many machines, but you also need to read in parallel on many machines. So each partition could be read by one consumer, and to be sure that when you want to read one topic that have multiple partitions, you will create what we call a consumer group. 
multiple consumers will read in parallel from different machines. And what is important, and this is why and how uh, Kafka scale, each partition are independent. We don't try to guarantee the order of read and write between, between uh, partitions. Because what is, what is very expensive in traditional uh, messaging system, it's all the transactional parts that they have, when they have to synchronize many, many things to be sure that it's read only once, or they want to be sure that all the messages are read, read in the same order. The guarantee of Kafka is on one partition, you will always have the same, you will guarantee the order, but between two, between two partitions, you cannot. So if we look at the way we generate data with a racing car, each car will have its own, not its own topic, but at least for a car, you'll be sure you will be on a single partition. Like that, all the messages sent by one car will be always in the same order. But maybe between two cars, you cannot compare exactly the data from Kafka. If you have a timestamp in the message generated by the car, you can start to work with a timestamp. So the way you work uh, when you deploy it is you have multiple producers, but you have multiple brokers, because this is how you will do partitions. Partition will be on each of the brokers, and you will read and write uh, from these different things. So it's putting a, a small cluster for high, availab high availability in uh, Kafka is three brokers plus zookeeper. So three zookeeper, three brokers. So what we have done with MAPAR is we use the API, but we change the storage. So we use the Kafka API to publish and subscribe. So like that, as a developer, you don't have anything to do, but we use the storage of MAPAR to do all the partitioning, replications, and, and all this, just to simplify the type of topology. And most of the time, because you want to integrate with the database, with the file system, to do the processing, and I will show you some processing in a minute, it's just one single cluster that can do everything instead of having multiple uh, clusters. So it's just using the same API uh, with a different storage. So when you publish a message, you have a, a producer. So it's in, a, it's in Java. And if you are familiar with Kafka, if you already use Kafka, you will see that the name, the first string, app, racing, stream, this is not compatible with Kafka as a name. Because since we don't have a server, it's a big cluster, it's just the location where it will be saved in the file system, all the logs, all the events. The topic is name sensor data in this case. But besides that, the code is just the Kafka code in 0.9 API for producing the message. And for consuming the message, you have a loop that will uh, read for messages and have an iterator on which you can do some information. So you see the record value. This is, for example, where I push it to the WebSocket or I save it into the database. So one of the key discussion we had with the team is also based on this, because you use standard API, Kafka, open API for the storage, pure file system on HBase or JSON database, it will be very easy to build new version of the application, add new services. And the first example was to focus on the data, capture more information. So today in the demonstration using Tor, I use JSON to emit and consume messages. JSON is very nice for developer. It's easy to look, it's easy to debug. Obviously when you work in real life with the cars, they are binary format, very optimized, uh, with almost very cryptic data that you have no clue what it is uh, beside if you have a, a specific uh, parser for that. But at least you see here, for a car, it, the, it will emit an event for a specific waste time and timestamp, and you have the sensor for speed, speed, distance, and RPM. By just adding a new sensor in the car, for example, you can generate new data. In this case, you have the throttle on the gear. You see uh, throttle 32 and gear number two. And this is where it's interesting to have a, a flexible schema when you store the information. Because everything that I have created, for example, with drill, with my code in the UI, doesn't know that we have new data until I want to use it. But also when I insert data in the database, because the schema is managed by the application itself, we have no uh, exception. 
So when you look at NoSQL, don't look only for my world, it's mostly big data because we don't do small clusters. But if you, many applications will benefit of the NoSQL part for flexible schema, where the application drives the schema, especially when you use a document database like, uh, like this. And the part that is the most interesting, it's bec because of the fact that we use Kafka-like MapperStream uh, tool, the producer and the consumers are totally disconnected. Like when you talk about microservices, when you talk about publish subscribe architecture. Uh, so you can, without changing the existing code, add new service. And in this case, the service that I want to use, for example, it's a new uh, service that will do processing of the stream. What I have showed you right now, it's very basic streaming, moving data from one point to another with almost no business logic to change something or to process. In this case, I just push the data in the dashboard, I save data in the database. Stream processing is about keep receiving the event and act on it, process, transform, use some functions to aggregate uh, data. And you just have to create a new consumer, a new Kafka consumer, and work with it. In this case, what we could imagine is to have a stream processing that will calculate and look at the, some average uh, tool or compare what is the speed, the position on the track, uh, the engine temperature, and so on, and emit an alert or save some aggregated data into the database every 10 minutes and so on, depending on what you want to do. And also, if I want to switch from this ugly dashboard to something new, I can add a new service without changing my existing code to develop a new analytics or pushing um, um, a dashboard technology. Uh, and this is um, easy because of the messages you have on Kafka. So, in, uh, in the Mapper and Hadoop ecosystem, what is used the most is Spark uh, as a distributed um, computing system. What is it? You have the MapReduce al uh, concept in the way you want to build. So you receive messages, you, uh, you transform them into a map, you apply functions, and you do that on a distributed model in memory with split on. Uh, on the disk, but it's in memory, and this is one of the reasons it's a lot, lot, lot faster than the Apache MapReduce that was using the disk to store all the intermediate state. And one of the benefits of Spark is you have the, spa the streaming part that can get the data directly from a Kafka message or some, or some other messaging layers. Uh, and Spark is the most used today uh, in the context of uh, MAPA or Hadoop or other platform. But you also have Apache Flink. Uh, the difference between Spark and Flink is Spark has been built as initially a batch-oriented approach. When you run you run job in parallel on many nodes in a very efficient way, compared with Apache MapReduce. And the streaming part has been added after, where Flink has been built first to do streaming, receive the stream, process the stream, and then, then added some stuff about batch uh, things. But they, are, they have similar capabilities. At least as an introduction, we can say they are very, very similar. In terms of adoption, Spark is uh, a lot more deployed than Flink. Uh, but I have built a demo with Flink uh, just to show you the streaming and how easy it is to uh, consume the information. So the idea here is to take the same, I don't, change anything to the existing code, I will just want to create a new job. This new job is somewhere here. We'll listen. As you can see, it's uh, Flink Kafka Consumer 09, so this is a tr the standard API for Flink. I have an environment just to show you how do you initialize. I do have a stream execution environment, some properties in the way you want to read, because you want to be able to read that in parallel on many nodes, because uh, Flink, like Spark, you may run that on many nodes, and you want to run that on many nodes if you have a, a big volume of information. 
And then what I do is I get a stream object, and this object, I will process it as first parse the JSON element, group by key, the key will be the car, and do a, I will go back to the time window, but do a reduce, do a flat map, so do the average uh, reducer and calculate the uh, average speed of a car. So I will start a new race. And I will, uh, I don't deploy Spark in this case because I want to show you two or three things that are quite interesting is, uh, I start my Spark application and you see we have group by key, so this is a car and then you have the speed and you have the time window of five seconds. So it will calculate automatically the speed for the last five windows, uh, five seconds, sorry. And in this case, you have for each car the speed for the five last seconds. You, can have, you have many ways of calculating that. If you want the current speed, at least from the beginning of the job, uh, the average speed, it will keep all, all the points and you have anything to do. It will calculate the speed of each car all the time, every time you have an event. And you, are, you, you have many options in the way you want to deal with, with time on event in Flink the way you deal with window, windowing of events. So here, if I want to, close to the dashboard, have an event that shows the average speed close to the, to, to the chart, I just have to consume this data. I've not done it yet, and I will, because I'm modifying the application. So just adding a new service is very easy in this case. Uh, and Flink has the advantage of being very, very easy in terms of uh, streaming technology, processing, streaming processing. So what, we, what I've showed you is when we talk about this project, it was really providing a framework to build new applications. So one of the first things is to be able to have a distributed and scalable processing on storage. Storage is an OSQL database on the distributed file system. The processing is a, a mix of streaming technology with Kafka, or mapper streams, or and Spark, and or Flink. And you have many, many, many other tools that are able to consume Kafka messages to, to work with uh, processing, ETL, uh, machine learning, depending on what you want to do. So it's an open API and open tools that were built. And the key part is to be able to decouple the source of the consumer to be able to create services. And I'm not talking about microservices here, but it's really to, be, to have each part of your application being one single process consuming the event, emitting new event, and make that very, very easy to add new use case. Or even to do, if you have, uh, I, will, if, I will take an example when I show you this. Uh, it's everything that I said about Formula One, you can apply exactly the same architecture and tools to many, many industries. And I have to say that I have not yet worked with this in production in Formula One or any kind of uh, motorsport, but in uh, telco, finance, retail, and IT content, I personally didn't work. Content as a website, I've not worked on this kind of project. But if you look at the finance, if you look at all the transactions, each transaction, a swipe, you, you swipe a card, you go on a website, you an analyze the user, it's one event. What you want to be able to do is capture this event. It's millions of events every second, if you look at for, uh, a credit card company. And you want to be able to process, for example, to do a fraud detection. A very, very basic thing that is done for many years with a company that, no, that do not need that, but it will be easy today to do with that, is the same credit card could not be used in London and in Paris, physically in point of sale, in less if you have 30 minutes between London and Paris. It's a fraud, so you have to refuse that. And you have to be sure you analyze that quickly enough to refuse the payment. But more importantly, you want to be able to process the data in real time and be able to compare that with some machine learning model. So in one side, you need a lot, lot, lot of data to learn. This one is a long process. 
but you also need to be able to apply the model in real time every time the, you have the event. And this is what uh, you, uh, you do in a financial uh, or telco also about the behavior of uh, users. And what is interesting by decoupling the source and the target or the consumer is you have a fraud model that is a V1 of the fraud model. You want to be able, without changing anything to this, create a new V2 model, consuming exactly the same message. And you will see over time if your, this V2 model is more efficient than the V1, you keep it in production or you decommission it. So all the A-B testing, all adding new features uh, on, on a tool, on a service, it's very easy with this specific architecture. So I like to finish my uh, demonstration with my small toy. Uh, it's just the same demonstration, but instead of using the Torx as a simulator, I'm using this uh, Anki drive. Do you, do you know Anki overdrive? You may have seen that on the Oracle booth. And I will uh, try to make it work. It's, it's a risky part. <laughs> so these cars are connect Bluetooth car, and I will connect them with a laptop. And I have a Node.js middleware that uses Bluetooth low energy to connect and communicate. It's a SDK that will send some information to connect, set the speed, and so on. So my uh, I will start my uh, server here, and it will send all the events, and I will come back to Kafka using the HTTP interface. So in this case, for now, this, is in, this initializes just a connection between my laptop and Bluetooth on the car. And then using, because it's a REST API to communicate with the car, uh, I will use a very basic script. Because I have not done all the UI to control the car. Where, if you see it, I will connect with one of the cars, Skull, with another car, and turn on login to get all the data from the car to the laptop, connect to another car, and then put the speed. So let's do all this. If you don't, they should turn blue, so just to say I am connected, and they should move on. Okay, one, two. And what happened here is you, you see the message at the top. It's all the message sending the car sent to the laptop. So what I do now, I consume this message and I push them to uh, a, a Kafka queue. And it's supposed to, and this is where it's... Uh, okay, so you see uh, one of the cars is not sending the data, but you see the speed here of scale on the battery level. And if I change the speed, it should, I, I should control the car using this post. Let's try to see if the speed will change. The car should go faster and send the data faster. So you see it's a little faster than sending the data. And what is interesting with this the reason why I use that is just more physical than the software, but also uh, it's an idea to organize hackathon to be able to develop any type of intelligence you want. And the way it works, you have almost zero intelligence in the car. A truck looks like that. Inside the, inside the, the truck, you have this uh, small uh, information. On, under the car, you have a small... Uh, uh, captor, a, a small camera. So this is why it follows the same track all the time. I can move speed, I can move track. On all the intelligence you want to build, you can build it from the application. It's a, it's a game, obviously. <laughs> it's not made for only for hackers. And all the intelligence in the mobile application. But the, you have companies that are explaining, and I have not done it yet, how you can do machine learning, how you can do kind of connected cars behavior with this very simple track. And what is interesting, you can even 
build, I will stop it because the noise is bothering me. Uh, you can print your own track with this uh, framework. So the, the, the interesting part here, and if you look at what I was saying at the beginning, where uh, Formula One, you cannot get the data in and re-influence back the car, here I can do it. Because I can get the data, do some intelligence, push the data back. And uh, quite easy to do in, uh, in terms of uh, information. And this specific tool that is generating some uh, paper track has been built by a German company in automotive that is building software to control cars. I, I, so I don't know exactly what they do because it's still uh, closed in, in terms of what they, they do, but they do machine learning and artificial intelligence in automotive industry. And they use this to uh, test some stuff. So it was just a fun part of it. This is what is closest for me to a Formula One, so I'm not able to generate terabyte of data yet. Um, if you, uh, oops. so the source code of all the demos are on GitHub, this one or the other. And if you want to learn more about uh, the technology that I use, is and especially the architecture globally, you have free eBooks. You go to mapar.com ebooks. You have it's, what is interesting about these books? They are small. They are 50 to 60 pages, so it's very easy, very quick to read, and give you a good idea of what you can do, which type of approaches. For example, in the streaming architecture part, we have a chapter around microservices: how you will use streaming technology to uh, assemble and have web, serv um, web services working, uh, microservices working together. One last comment is, as a developer, as an architect in an enterprise, if you believe uh, you need this kind of technology, usually it's very easy to have, you, you should test Kafka, take an evaluation of Kafka, uh, or MapperStream, uh, a NoSQL database. Try to understand what's the benefits of a NoSQL database if you don't do it yet. because. As I said, it's the flexible schema part on the scalability, it's a very interesting uh, thing when you want to build new type of application. Sometimes it's just for time to market. You go faster to develop because you have flexible, uh, flexible schema. Sometimes it's just because at scale, it's a lot easier to scale uh, a NoSQL database and a relational database. Uh, and, and you need, if you, st if you work with a lot of data, you need a way to process the data in real time using streaming or not. And this is why I put uh, Flink on Spark. Uh, you choose, on the market, the most used today is Spark, uh, but it's interesting to learn one of these technologies to see how it works, because first of all, enterprise, all the bank, insurance, b startups are dealing with large volume of data, they need this kind of skill. And the biggest challenge for us as a software vendor, it's not to find projects, it's to find skills to help people to deploy on white applications. So do you have any questions on everything I said? No? Thank you. Have a nice day.